This morning, join me in the book of Matthew, chapter 5, just below where Brother Brad read. We'll pick up at verse 13. We began our series last week on the foundations of discipleship, learning to live from Jesus. What did Jesus teach us? And what, how he taught us is really important. So today we're going to look, we're going to skip over the Beatitudes. We will go back to them. We will take them one by one because inside the Beatitudes, each Beatitude is mentioned at the beginning as a Beatitude. And then over in the sermon, Jesus addresses each subject individually. So we'll take them one by one. But today we'll see what the results ought to be as you read the, uh, the Beatitudes, and see what you're supposed to be. So today we'll ask the question, what are you? Not what just what you think you are, but literally, what are you? Now, when we read the passage, let's read together in uh, Matthew chapter 5, beginning at verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, and if the salt has lost its taste... How shall its saltiness be restored? Jesus asked a tough question, didn't he? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, you... Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So, what are you? Some would say, I'm a spouse, I'm a parent, I'm an employee, I'm an employer, I'm a friend, I'm a Christian, or I'm a Jesus follower. But are you what Jesus said you ought to be? What are you? Notice in verses 13 and 14, Jesus said, you are. What are you? You are. Our lives are to be are filled with many different choices. And in those choices, we make many, many, many different decisions. I'm going to ask my stunt man, my hero, John Mark, to come and... Uh, I uh, probably don't need to bring the coffee cup with you, John Mark. That could make things a little more hairy. Extra stump. Extra stump. You notice we have two ladders. One says me. I think you can see that with the, we got it blocked. One is me, and the other is Jesus. And so John Mark today is standing between the two. Now I'm going to ask him to go up the other run of the ladder. One more run. Can you do that? You did last week, but I moved them further apart this week. Yes, yeah. <laughs> we're, seeing, we're playing stretch man, too. Um, but here's what John Mark's going to decide. If he wants to get to the top of the Jesus ladder or the top of the me ladder, he's got to do what? He's got to go to one or the other. He can't continue stretching balanced. And... and that's where most people have lived their whole spiritual journey. They got saved, but they had to work. They got saved, and they had a family. They got saved, but they had life. But what we fail to understand is life, me alone, when I choose life the way most people have chosen life, becomes very selfish, very me-driven, very much what I need, what I like, what I want, what I think, what I've been taught. But when we turn to the Jesus ladder, then the me is absorbed in Jesus, and therefore I live a different life. We get to the end of this, Jesus will say, seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and all these other things will be what? Added unto you. And so, Visually, just place that in your mind. John Mark has to make a decision soon. He may get to the third uh, We're not going to try that. Um, we don't want to have a hospital visit today. But there's me and there's Jesus. And which ladder do you cling to the most often? Which one do you choose? Is it me driven? Well, 
I think, I assume, I feel, I hope, all of these are driven in one way or the other. Thank you, John Mark. Thank you, Levi, for being my protector of John Mark. Last week we saw when your normal day becomes a new day, when Jesus called his disciples, and then we looked in chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Most people think the new day is salvation, baptism, church membership. The day I got a new job at church and they trusted me to be over something, and that was my new day. That was my changing moment. No, my friend, until you are willing to be discipled, you are not what you need to be. Remember last week we said everybody needs someone to disciple them and everybody needs to be discipling someone else. Paul said it like this, you follow me and I'll follow Jesus. Somebody said, oh, it's all about Jesus. Don't follow me, follow Jesus. No, Paul said, you follow, I'll follow Jesus and you keep following me. It's a path of success. It's a path of of growing. As, as you are being discipled, you're bringing somebody along with you and being dis uh, discipling them in the same path you're in because both paths leads to Jesus and that's what the Bible teaches. Man-made doctrines and religions have changed that over the years. But let's notice what uh, we learned last week. We saw this quote. We, I just think it's so important we understand what you are. Um, in the classic of true discipleship. It says, discipleship is not primarily a matter of what we do. It's an outgrowth of what we are. I remember telling people, if you'll come to church, if you'll come to Sunday school, if you'll go through my new converts class, if you'll join the church, then all these things will just get into a rhythm and it'll be wonderful. No, it's what you are. That all works until catastrophe hits. That all works until life has a problem. And so what you are is so, so, so important. Notice, first of all, we learned that if we have the Beatitudes embedded in us and we're living them out in our lives, the first thing that happens is we have this supreme blessing that will make you salty. Now remember the word beatitude or blessed means supreme blessing. Now, there are a lot of folks who like to sing, we're blessed, we're blessed, we're blessed, we are blessed. And, and they, then they go immediately into the me world. We have shelter and food and clothing and the me world. We're not talking about me world at all. In this passage, what you are, you become salt. Jesus says the Beatitudes drive us to be salty. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how shall it be, how is its salt, is it saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Folks, listen. You and I can't fake whether we're a disciple or not. You can fake Christian. You can go around going, I'm a Christian. But you cannot fake the level of your discipleship. You can't twist it. You can't make it look good. When you refuse to be discipled, it is an act of rebellion against the Bible and Scripture. And God just makes it really clear, this is not going to be, you're not going to be salty. You've lost your saltiness. You can't reproduce the saltiness because you're faking it. It's not what you are. And so the primary use of salt has been many different things. One, it's, it acts as a preserve. Now, you can tell by the size of me, I like to eat. And one of my favorite foods, Robert and Tim are back there, and they eat breakfast, same place I do about every morning. I love country ham. I love salty ham. 
And wait a minute, before you say it's too salty, wait till we get toward the end of the sermon. You may not want to be using those phrases. Salt preserves meat. Salt is something that preserves, so I figure if I eat a lot of it, I'll be preserved for a long time. But my doctor says that's not true. But he, anyway. See, the primary use of salt is, is, is to be preserved. Jesus said that the only way this world can have truth is through the salt of his followers. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. Jesus would leave the church on earth. Remember, Jesus knows what's going to happen. He knows he's going to the cross. He knows, he knows he's going to bleed and die, and he's going to resurrect, and then he's going to ascend on high, and then the church is going to be left to be the salt. These men will be the salt of the earth. And, and the church is the only one that can provide morality and spiritual life and godliness in this world. You see, not only does the salt preserve, but the salt also is seasoning. Now listen, folks. Everybody in this room at one time or another has salted your food. You see, salt makes it taste better. And if you've got a really bad cook, use a lot of salt. And garlic helps too. Now, the element, now, my, I have a great cook, but I've eaten in other homes that didn't have such a good cook. You see, human cook, human life, human beings get salt through their food. Now, even warm-blooded animals need salt, and we normally get ours through seasoning because we like to salt our food. You can put a salt block out and deer will come to get it. You see, salty followers are not those who go around going, you need Jesus, you need Jesus. No, no, those aren't salty. They've lost their taste. Salty disciples live out what they are in the Beatitudes. See, I was taught you're the salt of the earth. You've got to go out and you've got to aggravate every single human on the face of the earth to make them know Jesus. And that's not true. Did you know that God has a plan? And that plan is that you and I be what we are and our witness will influence, transform, and change the lives of people. And we share the gospel. But you can't just go sharing. You have to go living first. You see, one of the things people have to understand is the world has to know they need the salt. Have you ever taken a bite of food and go, man, this, this food needs some salt? Sure you have. See, my grandmother had high blood pressure, and so she never used salt growing up. I lived in her home. I married Phyllis, and Phyllis's family liked salt. And first couple of bites, I went, mm. Then I realized it's much better with salt. You see, salt haters say this. This food is too salty. You, you all said it, haven't you? Did you know that's what the unbelieving world says about us? Hey, we don't mind you having a little salt, but don't get too crazy with the shaker. Right? And see, that's what you and I need to understand. We are the salt of the earth. And so when you're pouring on the salt, understand to this world sometimes we're too salty. And so therefore we must always listen to what Jesus is telling us because he knows how much salt they can take at a certain time. You see, the salt influences the taste and really it influences the moment. People who talk about God, I want you to catch this, without the right influence are always rejected. I think of all the people I've shared the gospel with who rejected me, and it was because I never took time to do the influencing first. I wasn't salt to them. I was just a voice. I was just a mouth. I was just another sound. But when you are salt to people, you have the opportunity to share the gospel. See, salt is more than just talking, it's action. 
let me just say this to you. Salt can't be used in social media. That's one of the biggest jokes when I hear Christians say, well, I'm just an influencer on social media. No, you're not. You're a nut in the house alone by yourself, thinking up stuff. You cannot be an influencer without action. They cannot see the action you do, so therefore, you're playing a game, you're pretending. See, followers of Jesus are often caught pretending and not really practicing. See, followers of Jesus go where people are and where people live in their lives and they speak in their lives through the saltiness of their lives and they share the truth. Now notice what David early says. Before you can be a disciple, you need to begin obeying everything Jesus commanded. Now, when we get over here, Jesus is going to talk about anger. He's going to talk about divorce. He's going to talk about how to treat each other. If you're holding a grudge. See, what you are has to be dealt with first. All of that has to be brought into obedience to Jesus before you can ever be sought. That's why you're discipling someone and being discipled. Now, the spring blessing of being salty is seeing that salt also, the third thing it's used for, did you know it's used for fertilizer? It helps grow stuff. Many parts of the earth world use it as a little bit of salt. I remember being in Africa and watching them use the salt. See, Jesus' disciples enhance the growth of God's work in this world when they are salty, not when they've lost their taste. See, the church can only advance the cause of Christ when it is salty, not saltless, when its taste is not gone. And there are many who have lost their taste. They've lived to the flesh and they've hung on to the me ladder all of their spiritual journey. And it's been all about me. It's what I like and what I love and what I need and what I want and what I got to have. And they've lost so much. You see... This foundation we're talking about is not salvation. But it's those who will be a hearer of the word will also be a doer of the word. Notice in the book of Acts, it was not just a book about the miraculous, but it also teaches us the apostle advanced the work of God. Notice what it said in Acts 2.42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship of and breaking of bread and prayers. Now remember where this is done. It's done in their houses. They did not have a church building. Let me go back and say this one more time. Nowhere in the New Testament do you have the sanctuary. Okay? Keep that in mind. Now, let's move on. And day by day, attending the temple together. Now don't confuse that. They were not going to the temple to worship. They were commanded to witness to the Jews of Jesus Christ. And where were the Jews gathering? At the temple. They went there to evangelize. They went home at night to worship. That's important. And breaking bread in their homes They received their food with glad and generous hearts. They were work, they were salt. They were salt at the temple. They were salt in their homes. They were finding the need to not be tasteless and to be not having a good taste. They they found themselves in the need to say, I want to taste. Good. I want the world to know my taste. I want to experience that taste in my life. My friend, let me tell you something. There are a lot of believers who've lost their tastelessness. 
They can't win their neighborhood. They can't win their community. They can't win the people they work with or go to school with. They can't reach anybody because they've not, what they are and what they say come two different ways. What you are is so, so, so important. Salt, Jesus points out, is what the world needs. Salt is a daily need in this world. Jesus is not pointing to a certain application of salt, whether it's fertilized, whether it's preserved, whether it's seasoning. He simply refers that in everyday life, God's people need to be the salt of the earth. The church has been worried about Sunday too long. We need to be worried about seven days a week being the salt of the earth and not losing our taste. Followers who will surrender their life and obey Jesus and make disciples will no longer need the me ladder. They will cling to the Jesus ladder at every step of their spiritual journey. See, there's a lot of folks who want to be a maker of believers. What do you mean? Well, they want to win people. But they don't want to disciple people. You see, there's a lot of people pretending to be a good Christian. Pretending to be a good disciple. See, the word we use oftentimes, we've already got a definition for and we think it's fine. It's kind of like the sign I saw the other day of a, said, parking, fine. Man, you're going to be fine if you park there. Policeman's writing the ticket, and the guy says, but you said it was fine to park there. <laughs> See the difference? In church world, many of you, when I say disciple, you go, okay, I'm a follower. I got this. Man, preacher, can we move on to some other topic? Because I've been a Jesus follower for so many years. Glory, and you're, you're missing it. It's not fine to park here. You see, it's not fine to park there. It's important to understand that finding to park is pretending. There's a lot of people pretending in worship, pretending in church, pretending in certain areas of their life, pretending to be, but they're really not who they say they are. Because they play church. They go through the motions. When I was a little boy, my hero was Roy Rogers. There's probably a lot of people in this room don't even know who in the world Roy Rogers is. But he was a cowboy. And in those cowboy shows, he could lasso, he could rope, he could shoot, and he rode his horse trigger. Well, on 425 Rice Avenue in Louisa, Kentucky, there was another Roy Rogers. His name was really Tim York. But I rode my pretend horse. I had a wife, pretend wife, named Del Rogers, Del Evans. And we had 13 kids. My mom used to tell, she'd say, it'd make me so mad, we'd have to wait for all 13 kids to get in the car before he'd let me shut the door. And on cold days, it was really aggravating. <laughs> See, some of you have pretended all your life. And you learn cute little phrases like, I want to see people saved, or I want to reach people, or I want to see people born again, or people need to be discipled more than they need all of those things. Because what we need is to disciple people to Jesus. At that point, they will be born again. At that point, they will be saved. At that point, their lives will be changed. Then we need to disciple them to be with Jesus, and then we need to disciple them to go for Jesus. I quoted David, early, early a moment ago, let's look at his chart that I think is really important. Everybody starts as a believer. Everybody needs to go to be a disciple. But you are not a real disciple until you are a disciple maker. And that's where you need to be. That's your target. Not just, I believe. Not just, I'm going to follow him a little bit, but I'm going to be a disciple maker. 
I brought a salt shaker with me. This salt shaker has salt in it. And Jesus said if this salt loses its taste, it's nothing but like to be trampled on. That's all it's good for. So are you someone who needs to be trampled? Or do you have taste in the spiritual life of saltiness? Second of all, and I'll move very quickly, supreme blessing to make you shine. Not only are you the salt, but you're to shine. Jesus said not only will you preserve and season and, and, and fertilize this world, but you're going to shine. You see, when something shines, it's bright, has glow to it. Now, Jesus said in verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. When I was a child, we, used to learn, we learned the little song. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. We'd say we're going to let it shine, put under a bushel, no. We were told to go to school and be Jesus at school. We were told to share the gospel. But, you know, I don't ever remember anybody ever telling me, Tim, you go help the struggling disciple become a better light. You be the light. You're the light. Wait a minute. I'm supposed to go help others be what? The light. I need someone else following me because I'm following him. It's almost like a competition. Who could be the greater light? And that's not the plan. The plan is to help everybody be the light. The light metaphor continues from the salt metaphor, and, but it takes us one step further, and Jesus illustrates the point. The light is an important theme throughout the scriptures. Understand that there is this great emphasis that when the light comes, darkness is removed. It is unfolding of biblical history, and it's the unfolding of scriptural theology. You see, the darkness is a description of the forces of darkness. The world, demons, our flesh, even the devil himself. Colossians would say that there is a kingdom of darkness. In this dark place, there's a literal contrast between the physical light and the darkness. Profound darkness between believer and unbeliever, between good and evil, between holy God and demonic Satan. You see, Jesus would later declare, I am the light of the world who has come as the light that enlightens all people. So those of us believing in him will no longer be in darkness, Scripture says, but we become the light. Now, in Palestine at that time, there would be a reservoir of oil and a wick, and they would light it, and there would be somewhat like a lantern, and that's what they called the lamp. You see, in the top of that hole that would pour oil in, and they would take that spout and they would light it, and there would be that glowing light in darkness. You ever been in real darkness? You ever been where there's no light at all? It's dark. Very dark. You see, that little modest light was an example of what it looked like in a Palestinian home to have darkness. Jesus' disciples are called to be the light of the world. You can't hide your light because that's what you are. This past Friday was my mom's 89th birthday. Now, Mom's been with the Lord now ten, almost 10 years. But I put on Facebook her picture. And every time I post a picture of my mom, here's what I hear. When I go back to my hometown, here's what I hear. Tim, you look just like your mother. 
she could never deny me. There were times she tried, but she could never get make it happen. You see, you can pretend to be somebody else, but you'll always be who you are, what you are, what made you. And so, if you're not of salt, you can't give salt. If you're not of light, you can't give the light, no matter how much you try. See, the kingdom of life within us is a test, living testimony of those in this world that we cannot hide. We are the light. Jesus' disciples would go into a kingdom that would change lives, but the lampstand would always be the light be drawn. You see, in that day, he tells us, like a city set on a hill. What they would do, they would go to the top of the hill where the city was because you always built your city on top of the hill so I can see your enemy coming. And number two, you could always roll them back down the hill. And they would light the whole city. And so when you're far off in a way off distance, you could see the light. I remember being in Ivory Coast, Africa many years ago on a back road in total darkness. The only lights we have is the lights on the little Jeeps we were driving. Of course, you, it's amazing your kidneys even stay connected to the rest of you, the way they jerk you and bounce you and beat you. And All of a sudden, you could see way off in the distance lights. You knew that was a town. You knew there was some civilization there. You can't hide that. See, you don't have to tell people what you are. They'll see it. Now, does that mean you don't share the gospel? No, don't, don't, don't twist words here. Don't, don't play the twist word game on this because this is important. This is spiritual truth. You cannot talk about what you are not made of. And not only what you're made of, what, you're, what possesses you, controls you and lives in you. It cannot be hidden in your lives. You can't tell others about the gospel if you're not living it. And living it is more than just saying, I got saved. Living it is living these beatitudes in the areas that we will struggle in. We must be salt in those areas. And so throughout the next several weeks, you're going to hear a lot about salt and shine when we deal with each of these beatitudes. You see, there are a lot of broken people. And we've been taught to almost abuse broken people. Talk about them. Push them down. No. Broken people need salt and light. They need us to shine to them. Shine in your life and your voice. Make disciples. Instead of trying to get people just to pray a prayer and attend church on Sunday, disciple them to Jesus and disciple them to a life change. We need to be shining both close up and in the distance. You ever been in darkness and all of a sudden a big light come on? It's not comfortable. That's what we often do to people. We shine the light in their face and go, you need to get right with God. No. Sure they need to get right with God, but we've got to disciple them to the light. Not beat them to death with the light. See, there's a lot of pretend living. But in the next three chapters, Jesus is going to tell us how to live and be the light. You can't fake it. You can't hide it. Because you're the light. And when the light is really the light, it's different. Now, this morning, I brought a candle. This ought to make you nervous. One time I was at a, I did a church mortgage burning and we almost had to rebuild the church, but that's okay. We almost set the church on fire. This candle. If we'd turn the stage lights and all the lights off, it'd really glow, wouldn't it? And what Jesus says is, you can put a cover over it, but if it was dark, you could still see what? The glow. Now, if you're playing light, 
the light's not a big deal. But when he's the light and you're in the light, and you're shining the light, you can't hide who you are. You can't hide what you are. You can't hide what God's doing in your life. And that's what we need to learn. It's the substance of what we are. This past week, I was uh, at Rotary Club, and our speaker was the uh, assistant professor of concrete industrial management. Did you know MTSU out here at Murfreesboro was the first college to ever have uh, a concrete industrial management class? Concrete's a big deal in Smyrna, if you don't know that, in Rutherford County. But did you know if you took Georgia, Alabama, and Tennessee and put all of our concrete together, we don't have as much concrete as Florida. Just something I learned at lunch. Toward the end of his talk, I learned later, Katie has actually done this as an engineer. He talked about that right now his students are building a concrete canoe. And everybody around my table goes... I mean, I got a doctor sitting there. I got state representative sitting there. We got all kinds of people. They go, it'll sink. And about five minutes later, he goes, oh, you all think it'll sink, right? He said it will unless you get the right dimensions. And he said when you get the right dimensions, you can race in it. And colleges actually take concrete canoes and race. Now, hear me. We've taken the Bible and we've made concrete canoes out of it. But they what? They've sunk, they sink. They didn't work. Think about all the canoes you've built in your life from this Bible because you took part of what the Jesus said and tried to make the canoe yourself. Let's use his dimensions. Let's use his plan. And that canoe would float. So the question is, do you want to use yours or his? What are you? 